Alrighty, let's go ahead and get started. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. It's now technically afternoon. It's a few seconds after 12. So uh, I hope that everyone is having a great day so far. And today we're going to be doing something a little bit different from what we've done on the stream before. Uh, traditionally, we've essentially been writing code. Uh, we've been kind of creating a code base in a language that we already know, using it to practice some skills that we may be learning or need some improvement on. Um, but, you know, we haven't been really doing anything that's groundbreaking or new. 
Today, we're actually going to be doing something a little different. We're going to be learning a language pretty much from scratch. So the language that we're going to be covering today is the C programming language, which is a language that many people have probably heard of. If you've gone through a computer architecture course or anything of that nature, then you've probably been subjected to at least a little bit of C. I certainly was in my computer architecture courses and then in subsequent courses and also doing compiler development. Uh, I've been exposed to a lot of C over my time, uh, being a computer scientist, being a programmer. So it's definitely a very important skill to know. And the big motivation for why we are doing this today is that my students from my last semester of being a computer science teaching assistant are about to go into a course uh, for which the majority of the code that they're writing is going to be in C. And then a little bit in assembly, which we might talk about um, in the future, we may do some assembly programming streams just in case I decide that I really, really don't value my sanity. Um, but anyway, yeah, we're going to be talking about C today. Uh, and the objective of today is just going to give you a very high level overview of C, uh, you know, kind of an introduction to the basic concepts of the language and some kind of just important background information in addition to learning about some of the fundamental concepts that we need to know in order to work with primarily integer types uh, in C. And uh, dinosaur leaves, that's a, that's a pretty good pun. So let's go ahead and just get started. Let's just get right into this. And I know that no one really likes PowerPoints, and I'm not really sure I've seen someone give a PowerPoint on Twitch before, but uh, we have some fun things to look at. So let's just very briefly go through a small history of the C language. And Prince Logic, when do we skip to C++? Um, maybe, maybe at some point we can do C++ too, but for now we're just going to be focusing on C. Anyway, so the C language kind of gets its start. Every programming language has this sort of genealogy. Programming languages are almost never invented completely in isolation. When we're talking about a programming language and considering the types of decisions that went into the design of a programming language, we have to consider the historical context out of which that language was born. So for C, this kind of progeny and this chain of languages begins with a really old language that you probably haven't heard of called BCPL. Now, BCPL was a language invented by a man named Martin Richards at the University of Cambridge in 1967, uh, and he still actually maintains this language. But BCPL was designed to be a systems programming language, so a programming language with which you could write low-level software for the computers that were starting to emerge at the time. Computers were getting a little bit more powerful, they were able to do more, and so people who were programming them wanted to have a kind of expanded set of abstractions to use. And so BCPL was a programming language that provided them with a pretty good set of abstractions that they could use. Um, but it had a few issues, and the biggest one was that the compiler for BCPL and the runtime and kind of the way that it worked uh, being it essentially compiled down to an intermediate language that then had to be compiled down to the specific machine, machine was suboptimal for some of the alternative computing models that were starting to emerge that we'll look at. And a notable feature of BCPL is that it only featured one type, which was the machine word. So a machine word is the size, typically defined as the size of a register on your machine. And a, a register is just kind of a little tiny bit of memory that's embedded in your CPU and on which most CPU instructions are performed. And so BCPL, the machines at the time, were not able to subdivide their words. And so BCPL had one type, the machine word. And it, just to give you kind of a sample of what BCPL looked like, this is a short program to print the, for the first 10 factorials in BCPL. I am eternally grateful to Wikipedia for uh, giving me the source code to this, uh, because I've read the BCPL documentation and I honestly can't make an incredible amount of sense of it. But yeah, so this is a program to print the first 10 factorials, and honestly it doesn't look that much different from things we're used to. We've got this git command that fetches uh, an external module called libheader. We've got start, which is our main method for our program. And it's saying that the return value of start is going to have 
a for loop with a variable called i from 1 to 10. Yes, we had for loops at this point. Algol is was far before this. And then we've got this function to print some contents to the screen. And then we say the result is 0. And down here, we've got this factorial statement, which features something that's actually really kind of cool in BCPL, which is that it had guard statements, a lot like a lot of contemporary programming languages, which basically says if n is 0, then the return value of this method is 1. Otherwise, it's n times factorial, n minus 1. This is the traditional stupid definition of factorial, because I didn't want to figure out how to do memoization in, in these old languages. But yeah, so that's what BCPL looked like. And now, following up on BCPL, uh, at a, at a uh, corporate laboratory called Bell Labs that many of you have probably heard of, it was one of the leading centers of computing innovation in the 60s and 70s and even into the 80s, a man called Ken Thompson decided that he wanted a lightweight version of BCPL, that language we just looked at, for many computers. And so, as I said, BCPL is pretty heavyweight. A lot of underpowered or a lot of lower-powered computers at the times had difficulties running BCPL programs. And so he wanted a version of BCPL with all of the kind of stuff that he thought wasn't necessary stripped out. So as a result, he named this language B because computer scientists, as you'll see many times today, are historically some of the most creative people around. So yeah, lightweight version of BCPL, cut it down to one letter, called B. And just for a little bit of context, this is what a mini computer is. Um, this is the DEC PDP-7, uh, which is very likely a computer that the guys over at Bell Labs would have had at this time. Uh, and so yeah, so th this is what we're referring to by mini. And it, by mini, we basically mean doesn't take up an entire room. So yeah, so this is a prototypical mini computer. You can see over on the right, we've got a teletype terminal. Here we've got an oscilloscope, something like that. Pretty wild bit of kit. And again, just for a little bit more of context, yeah, many in the scariest of scare quotes. Um, and Blue Jay says, how portable? And well, if we compare it to the other machines that are around at the time, yeah, it kind of was actually. Uh, it's a sick gaming rig, that's, that's funny. Um, anyway, this is an IBM System 360. This is one of the most popular mainframe systems of the time. So mainframe was what was in opposition to many computer. And so you can see that, first off, this computer takes up an entire room. Um, we've got all kinds of different machinery. We've got tape drives over here. Uh, these are also related to tape reading. I have no clue what this is. And then this is our central compute unit. This is our CPU, which, by the way, extends about, I think it's somewhere around eight feet backwards from this picture. Uh, and there's other kit in this room as well that they're not showing. So yeah, that was a computer. And now before we get into talking a little bit about C, uh, Prince Logic, yeah, all those stations are part of one computer. Um, if you've ever built a PC or you open your PC, you'll know that we have a lot of these kind of discrete components, right? We've got a CPU, which nowadays is, you know, about yeah, something like this big, something like that, if you can complete this uh, square. Yeah, something like that big, it's pretty small, uh, versus, you know, being a, a 10 by 10 block that weighs several tons. You've got disk drives still, memory, the working memory of this system is probably somewhere here, I don't know. But yeah, and so yeah, all these parts are part of one computer that nowadays we've miniaturized into one little tiny thing that you can hold in the palm of your hand. Pretty, pretty crazy. And now before we get into C, um, I just, this is just literally just because it's cool. Uh, this is a machine called the IBM System 360 Module 91. This is the model that was installed at Princeton University in the late 60s. Uh, this is the operator's console. And so here you can see basically every little bit of kind of state that this machine stores. The register file is somewhere here. Uh, some parts of memory, different status words, different parts of instruction execution are all shown here. And so yeah, so th th this was a mainframe, uh, and I've got the phrase down in the bottom, Vachen das Blinken Lights. Uh, if you're not familiar with what that phrase means, then I encourage you after we're done here, or just right now, to go Google Blinken Lights. Uh, it's a funny little bit of like late 60s, early 70s hacker culture that just refers to the fact that all computers had these flashy blinky lights like this. It's the 60s version of RGB, except it was actually useful. Uh, so yeah, so... 
that's kind of the context in which B came out, and this is an example of some B code that I wrote last night, hopefully it doesn't contain any bugs, uh, to print the first 10 factorials. And so you can see that this looks a little more familiar now, right? We've got some things that we recognize. We've got a recognizable if statement, which is great, and we've got, you know, return statements, which we like, and it really, this code you could actually just compile and run in modern C or in Java or whatever, you know, uh, whatever programming language you choose with some minor modifications. And then down here we've got our main function, which does the same thing, and Ken Thompson just did not think that for loops were a necessary part of a programming language, so B does not have them. We had to write it ourselves using uh, using an increment operator and a manually tracked variable. Auto here means something different from what it means in C++. Auto means that the compiler would automatically assign the storage class of the variable. So in these really old languages, it oftentimes was necessary to distinguish between whether a value was going to be stored in memory, in RAM, uh, or in a register, and uh, B just had this keyword auto to say, put it wherever you think would be best. So yeah, that, that's what that's what auto means in this context. It's not uh, it's not it's not type deduction. No, B was like BCPL in that it had a single type, the machine word. And it, now this whole you know kind of singly typed thing worked really really well for mainframes, which had all kinds of weird word lengths. Uh, Honeywell systems were famous for having 36-bit words because sure, um, and other systems had 40 or 48-bit words, and it was all over the place. Um, I think there were some systems even had like 9-bit words. So yeah, so you couldn't rely on much in these days, not much was standard. Uh, so yeah, BC, or B, sorry, excuse me, had still a single type. C, on the other hand, is the successor to B, and so in the same vein in which we, uh, we have C++ following C, C here is literally B++. Uh, it was an evolution of the B language created again at Bell Labs by a man named Dennis Ritchie in 1972 that addressed the biggest problem that they had with B, which was that whole single, uh, single type machine word thing. Because the MIDI computers that they were receiving at the time, most notably uh, machines like the PDP-10 and 11, allowed you to not only access machine words, but also subdivide them. So, for example, you could have a 16-bit machine word, like was on the PDP-11, but you could also access just a single byte of that word. And it, the languages of the time, BCPL and B, weren't really able to take advantage of this, but the guys at Bell really wanted to because it was very, very useful uh, when dealing with text right? ASCII being a single byte in coding. They wanted a way to efficiently deal with ASCII characters. And so that's why we really wanted to have a language that allowed for byte addressing of memory, which is a prominent feature of C. And so C has multiple types. That's something that we're going to see all throughout today, but it, at the time, in the historical context, it was pretty important. And now initially C was used to develop tools for Unix, which was the research operating system that was being developed by Bell Labs at the time. Most of you are probably familiar with Unix in some form or another. If you have a Mac or a system that's running Linux or BSD, then you almost definitely are running a Unix or Unix-inspired operating system, uh, Mac OS being a true Unix and Linux not. Uh, and so, yeah, so Unix is one of those things that has evolved throughout uh, the years and has kind of become this almost standard um, computing environment that a lot of us in computer science use. But at the time, it was in its infancy. They needed tools for Unix, and so Dennis Ritchie used C to write some of those initial tools. And eventually, C turned out to be so useful for writing code for Unix, and especially writing code that could be ported between different machines because of the level of abstraction that it featured, it was eventually used to rewrite almost the entirety of the Unix code base for easier porting between different machines. And so yeah, so this was a major breakthrough at the time, that you could write an operating system in a fairly higher level language. High level being, you know, in comparison to assembly or machine code. 
But yeah, at the time, it was a pretty cool innovation. And finally, we get to our first little bit of C code that we're going to see today, which is the same program to print the first 10 factorials. And now we're not going to dwell on this for too long, uh, because we do have some other stuff to get to. Uh, namely, we're going to start talking about how C and Java differ, but just at the very beginning, you can see that this program obviously looks a lot more like B than BCPL, and thank the gods above for that. Um, I don't want to write BCPL. Um, and so here's our factorial routine, and here you can see that we've added the ternary operator, which I was reading the B documentation, and it seems like it had, um, but that it's, doesn't really matter that much. And you can see this works just like we're used to from Java, if you're a Java programmer or PHP, if you write PHP. Um, and then we've got our main function, which looks almost exactly the same as the B one, except we now get counted for loops, which are a really, really super nice innovation that I'm sure we're all grateful for if you're doing any type of array or list processing. And I will also note that the C that I have written here is what we would consider modern C. It's C that feature, or it's C that makes use of some language features that were added in the 80s and 90s to make it a little bit easier to write C. Uh, this includes things like declaring the variable inside the for loop and a few other niceties, but that's not going to be too important for us here. Today, we're not going to be focusing on ancient C, we're going to be focusing on C as it is today. And now here's a photo of this really, really famous book called The C Programming Language, which was written by um, by Dennis Ritchie himself, so the guy who initially designed the C language, and Brian Kernahan, uh, another very famous computer scientist working at Bell Labs. Uh, it's oftentimes called K&R, after these two authors. And this is the book that kind of first standardized the C language. And so, back in the 80s, if there was any version of C that your compiler supported, it was almost definitely what we call KNRC, the version of C that is used in this book. Uh, my students who are going into a computer architecture class, you might have actually been asked to purchase this book, and I myself was actually going to purchase a copy of it recently, because I, surprisingly enough, didn't have one. And I'm really sorry that Pearson took over the publisher that publishes this. It's so expensive. Um, but yeah, so this is kind of... If you want any book on C, this is, this is the book to get. It's written very well, and it's been used by programmers for, at this point, nearly half of a century to learn the C language. All right, now let's move on to another sub another subject, which is how does C differ from Java? Now, this whole series is going to be given from the perspective of a Java programmer, since my students who are moving on to computer architecture are Java programmers for the most part. They've written mostly Java for their courses. So we're going to talk about how C is a little bit different from Java. Now, the biggest difference, well, one of the biggest differences, but the biggest kind of immediately visible difference is that C and Java use different programming paradigms. So C is what we call a procedural language, whereas Java is object-oriented. And what this means is that C will allow you to structure data. So you can group things together. You can group together, you know, a series of integers and floating point values and pointers and all kinds of stuff into this one little packet of state, but you cannot define a class. Classes referring to data structures that allow things like method implementations, they allow potentially things like polymorphism in addition to encapsulation, abstraction, all of the, you know, object-oriented pillars that we've been working with so far, you're not going to see in C. So in C, instead of calling methods on objects, so instead of saying object.method, C functions are free, which means that we call the method, or sorry, we call the function, and we pass the value we want to manipulate to the function instead of calling the function on that object directly. And now I will make a very brief notational note here. We previously have called essentially any routine a method, because in Java, everything is a method. C does not feature methods, and so I'm going to be saying the word function for the remainder of this series. In any C code we write, we want to use the word function instead of method. Um, again, a function is a routine that takes in a bit of state and outputs 
a single value, which is what C functions do, versus methods, which can do all kinds of other things. They're called on objects. But yeah, we're going to be talking about functions in C. And as I said earlier, not being an OO language, C does not have primitives for encapsulation, polymorphism, and inheritance. So yeah, if you were someone who really liked having things like access modifiers and polymorphic methods, or you really liked to create these giant kind of Frankenstein class hierarchies, unfortunately, you cannot do that in C. But we will show you how to properly structure data in your C programs, and it's not as bad as it may sound. The next biggest difference is that C compiles to native code versus Java code that runs in a virtual machine. So what this means is when you write a C program and you compile that program, it compiles it to your machine's native bytecode, which means that it is essentially compiling to code that runs directly on your CPU. So it's compiling down to instructions that are given directly to your processor and executed. Versus in Java, we had the JVM that kind of lived in the middle, which executed JVM bytecode as an intermediary. And so in C, we don't have that kind of middle step of having to go through the JVM or through a virtual machine to execute our code. It's running straight on the hardware with some abstractions, but it's running pretty much straight on the hardware. And what this means is that oftentimes C programs will run faster and use less memory than Java. Faster because, well, we don't have this intermediary layer of virtual machine. And, you know, JIT compilation can kind of am ameliorate some of these effects, but for the most part, your C program is still going to run faster because there isn't a middle layer doing interpretation. And a C program will use less memory because, well, we'll get to that. But a big reason is that you're A, not having to maintain virtual machine state, but also heap management works a little bit differently. You don't get this kind of weird giant pre-allocated heap like you did in Java. And now another aspect of this that is somewhat related and is going to be very important for us as we go forward is that Java provides this kind of standard interface on all architectures and platforms. Like when we opened a file in Java, you didn't need to know if the program was running on Windows or Mac OS or Linux or Unicos or VMS. It You you just said file.open. Uh, well, you didn't say file.open, you said buffered reader new file blah 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 but anyway um but anyway you didn't need to know the platform and regardless of what architecture what you know type of cpu your program was running on you didn't need to change anything right java provided this standard abstract machine on which your code runs in c we do not have the same level of guarantees provided by our abstract machine c is still defined in terms of an abstract machine but the semantics of that machine may differ. And so as a result, your C programs can sometimes not be quite as portable as a Java program might be between different architectures or platforms. And so yeah, something important to keep in mind when we're writing C is that portability can be tricky. Another big difference is that C is not managed versus Java, which features managed memory. And all this means is that in Java, we had this really cool thing called the garbage collector that would periodically traverse the heap and figure out what little bits of heap memory have you reserved but aren't using anymore, and it would free them for you so that you did not have to do that yourself. It was very handy, and in C, we don't have it. So yeah, all of our aspiring computer scientists here today are going to be picking up a new career as garbage collectors because in C, you are the garbage collector. You are responsible for managing the heap yourself. And this is something that we're probably going to spend the better part of a day on later, just how we do manage the heap in C. It's not as scary as it sounds, but there are a lot of concepts that we've got to learn before we get there. But yeah, so for now, all you need to know is that C, no garbage collection, no virtual machine, very little runtime, you've got to manage memory yourself. Instead of references, C exposes raw pointers. This is something we'll get into. We're not going to dwell on this for now. And a really big difference here is that in C, your memory operations are not checked. So in Java, you may be kind of familiar with the concept that if you have an array and you try and access something in that array that is not in bounds, right? So in other words, you exceed the bound of that array and you try and access something off the side, you get an exception. You get a warning that says, 
hey, well, it'll probably crash, but you get an exception that says, hey, you tried to access something that was out of bounds, you can't do that. C, on the other hand, doesn't care at all what you do with memory as long as the operating system doesn't catch you. So if you allocate an array and you try and access one index off the end of that array, in Java you would get an exception, in C you'll either get garbage or your program will crash. Which is, you know, cool. Um, in addition to things like pointer dereferences, you can dereference literally any address you want. Again, most of them will probably crash due to your operating system's memory protection. But yeah, so you, but you can still do it. And so yeah, in C, you can do any memory accesses you want. It doesn't care. And another aspect of this is, and something that's going to be very cool that we're going to play with on a future day, is that the memory layout of structures in C is deterministic. This means is that in Java, when you define a class with some instance variables, you're telling the JVM, hey, I have this class that has these instance variables. The JVM says, okay, cool, I'm going to implement those instance variables, I'm going to lay them out in memory however I feel like. Right? You get no guarantees about how your structures are laid out in Java. Versus in C, the memory layout is determined. If you say that you define a structure with an int and then a float, and then you look at memory, you'll see an int and then a float. And when we talk about structs, we will be playing with that. It lets us do some fairly interesting things. Another big difference, and this does really pretty much follow from the whole unchecked memory operations thing, but it's more of a general rule. Java has exceptions for error handling, and in C, you are also responsible for rolling your own error handling system. So, yeah, in it, in C, oftentimes instead of exceptions, we'll see functions that return an integer error code that you have to then manually check after you call the function to make sure that nothing went wrong. That's a pretty common idiom, and we'll, we'll play with that. And I will note here, though, since C is a Turing-complete language, it is, of course, possible to implement exceptions in C. Please don't do that. I have seen people who've actually tried to roll their own exception system for C. I've actually done it before. And you can do it. Don't. It, it violates pretty much all of the assumptions that people make about C programs, and it's just going to end up being pretty brittle. We're going to stick with integer error codes and pointer return values uh, to signify these types of things going forward. And so, the kind of overarching theme that we're seeing emerge here is that Java gives us a lot of protections. Oh, Expo Seed, how do you, how do, you do what? Uh, oh, implement exceptions? Um, we, we might get to that. Uh, in short, if you look up the header longjump.h, uh, it will show you how to do that. Uh, very, very briefly, you essentially set an address that you want to potentially jump to, and that's kind of like having a try-catch. And then um, if you want to throw an exception, then you jump to that memory address and start executing code from there. That, that's like a throw statement. That, that's kind of how you'd implement it. But anyway, kind of the big overarching principle here is that Java protected us a lot. Java was kind of like a mother bird that holds us in the nest and brings us food and cares for us. Versus C is a lot more like a mother bird that has a bird hatch, and then it just yeets it right out of the nest almost instantaneously. Yeah, C really doesn't care. Uh, and so there's this quote from a person named Waldy Ravens that circulates the internet a lot, yet I can't really find any actual proof that this person ever existed. But anyway, there's this quote, A C program is like a fast dance on a newly waxed dance floor by people carrying razors. Which I think is fairly accurate. What this means is that, well, C is unsafe, right? We can do a lot of unsafe things in C. Like I said, if you want to access memory off the end of an array, go for it. No one's going to stop you, other than maybe your OS. But C isn't going to stop you. If you try and do some nonsense with pointers and try and, you know, assign too much memory or you try and copy things that don't belong, again, C doesn't care. And it... This can at first seem very scary, because it seems like, you know, we're essentially at so low of a level that, you know, we have to protect ourselves from ourselves, and that is partially true, but this aspect of C also lets us do some very, very, very cool things, which is where the fast dance come in, comes in. 
And I hope that over the course of this series, I can show you some of the super duper cool things that we can do as a result of C being, you know, an unsafer, lower level language. And so with all that being said, let's now move on and write some C. So, all right, so let's go ahead and start writing our very first C program. Now, the program that I've got open here is JetBrains' C Lion. Uh, it's, it's an integrated development environment for C. I will note, you don't need an IDE to write C. Like, you really, really don't. Uh, you, you can get by just fine with a plain text editor. Uh, something like Vim or Emacs or VS Code. But I'm going to be using C Lion just partially because I'm live coding on stream. Um, and I want to make sure that I don't make stupid typos, uh, but also because it provides a really nice debugger that we're going to be playing with in the future. But yeah, let's go ahead and get started, and let's write our very first C program. Now, this program is inspired by, which means copied almost entirely from, one of the first B programs ever written, or, or from a didactic example of B, then C. So this is probably the most famous program in the world. Um, it was initially written by Dennis Ritchie in the documentation for B, at least it's one of the first examples of it that we have, and it's been used to show nearly every programming language since then. So let's go ahead and get started with this. Now, whenever we write any C program, we have to have an entry point. An entry point really is just a function called main that returns type integer. If we don't have that, then uh, the linker is going to yell at us and we get really cryptic error messages that are some of the hardest to debug. Uh, so yeah, so we've got to have a main function, tells us what we want to do when our program starts. And this program is going to contain a single line of code. I'm going to call a function called put s, and it, what put s does is it's going to output a string to standard output, which means our our console. And the message that I'm going to print is, of course, the well-known, very famous, hello world. Okay, so here is our first C program. And I can see this, but you can't for some very strange reason. We can see that uh, CLion is highlighting put S in red. And it's telling me that, hey, that's not a function that you've defined. And we're not too crazy that we're actually going to write our own output function. So I am going to include a file called stdio.h, stands for standard input output, that is going to provide a lot of functions that let us interact with files and with text terminals or consoles. So yeah, here is our first C program. Now, some things to note. This include statement is a lot like an import statement in Java. So this would be a lot like saying, you know, import uh, java.lang.system, something like that. Or .system.out. It, it would be roughly equivalent-ish to doing something like that. But all we need to know for now is that whenever we see this hash include, it's an analog of a Java import statement. Then here, this function, again, is just going to output some text to the terminal. And now we see that this function returns type int. And we haven't actually returned anything. And it, you can't actually omit the return value in C for functions that return ints. It's not recommended. And so by default, if we just leave out the return, this function is going to return zero, which on pretty much every operating system we see nowadays indicates that the program terminated successfully, ran all of its code, and then it quit due to a predefined condition. But I personally don't like ever leaving kind of dangling return values on functions, these implicit return zeros. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to return a value called exit success. Now, exit, exit success is defined in stdlib.h, which just kind of contains some more functions for doing things like interacting with memory. And if we hover over this, we can see that exit success is just defined to zero. So yeah, nothing super duper fancy, but it can help us to increase the readability of our programs if we just always return a value. 
Now, we had a question in the chat. What does a .h file look like? That is something that we'll get to on a future day. We'll get to kind of how we structure a C program, like a big C program overall. For now, you just need to know that a header file is essentially a definition of all of the functions that we want to be externally accessible from a file. So it essentially defines the public interface of a C program. Uh, but yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll get into that. We'll get into that in the future. Uh, and Blue Jay, you've been reading it as studio the entire time. Yeah, I sometimes pronounce this as studio just to bug people. Um, but yeah, usually people, I think, just say SDDIO. Y'all can correct me in the chat if we have any experienced C programmers. But yeah, I, I always just pronounce it SDDIO. You can say studio, though. So, all right, let's go ahead and run this program now. So, now, my students are primarily going to be working on Unix machines. And many of you who are out there who might not be in their shoes are probably also primarily going to be writing C on non-Windows platforms. And what that means is that you will probably be compiling your C programs through a text terminal. And so let me go ahead and briefly pop up a terminal here. So this is the Unix terminal that's given to us by WSL. Popcorn, you say standard IO. Yeah, that works too. You can you can say you can say that too. Yeah, STD in C stands for standard, not the other thing that you might think it stands for. Yeah, so here's a text terminal. And if you don't know how to use the Unix terminal, it's a very important thing for you to learn, but I'll tell you everything today that you need to know to compile a C program. And now the way that we're going to compile our code is by executing the system C compiler. Now, depending on what machine you're on, this compiler might be called something like GCC. Probably if you're on Linux, it might be called Clang if you're on Mac OS. But to just compile a C program, we have this standard alias called CC defined that just refers to the system's C compiler. And now what we're going to do is we're going to type the name of the program that we want to compile. So the name of the program is hello.c. And now if we just run this, then we get no output, and in C, no output from the compiler is a good thing that indicates that our program compiled successfully. And now if we look at a directory listing, we see that we now have this new file called a.out. And that is the binary file, the executable that was compiled from our C program by CC. Now by default, if you don't specify an output program name, then your C compiler is going to give you this file called a.out. Personally, I am not the biggest fan of this convention. I think that having programs called this does not make a lot of sense. So let's remove that, and let's show you how to compile a C program and specify a name for your executable. And so we're going to do this by way of the dash o flag. So this additional little bit that we've added on to the end of our command just says, I want to compile the file hello.c and output it to a binary file called hello. All right, and there we go. So now we can go ahead and run this. We get no output, which is good. And now we see that we have a binary file called hello. So now we can go ahead and run this on the command line by just typing dot slash hello. Now, we have to include the dot slash. We are running an executable from our local directory, which means that we always have to type the dot slash to say, hey, run this program in the current directory. And now if we type dot slash hello and we hit enter, we'll see that we get the output that we were expecting, which is hello world. So we've confirmed that we have everything working. Now, if you're following along with this lecture as we're going, uh, you could actually type this program in, this very short C program, and run it, uh, and make sure just kind of that your compiler's working and all that kind of stuff. If you don't have a C tool chain set up right now, that's fine. You can totally do that at a later date. You're not going to need it for today. Yeah, there we go. There is our binary. And now, oh, Prince Logic, you've seen it, you've seen it do a dot out. Yep, that, that's just the default name. And I think, actually, if you do it multiple times, then the next one is called b.out. I'm not fully sure of that. So, we've got a.out, uh, cc, hello.c. No, it's not. Okay, it's just a.out. Uh, I might be thinking of something else that does that then. But okay, so there we go. So, there was our first C program. And to our Java programmers out there, you know, this 
isn't really much different from what we're used to, right? In Java, our print statement was obviously much longer. We had to say, you know, system.out.println, and puts is the C analog to system.out.println. But, you know, overall, this isn't too bad. This looks a lot like what we're used to. The return value of main's a little bit different. We don't have any arguments for now, but, you know, this, this is pretty familiar. All right, so now we may have some of you who are also trying to follow along with us on Windows, and I'm just going to preemptively apologize. I have no clue how the Windows compiler tool chain works. Uh, it's deeply confusing to me. Uh, and plus, I do all of my development. Um, I do all of my development on uh, on Linux, and so I'm not really too familiar with how the Windows compiler works. But I'm just going to be using CMake uh, in C Lion to run my program on Windows, and you can see that we compile it using the Windows compiler tool chain. We get the same thing. Hello world. Oh, and we had a question. Uh, does puts automatically add backslash n? And then another question: What's the difference between puts and printf? Right. So puts is a lot simpler of a function. It's used to literally just output a string to the screen. It's again equivalent to system.out.println. We use it to just print a single string to the console, and that's it. Printf, on the other hand, which by the way is also defined in standard I/O, allows us to uh, do the same things that we would do in system.out.println. Namely, it lets us do substitutions. And so I can say, you know, hello, my name is percent %s, something like that. And then I can sub and then I can supply some arguments that should be substituted for these format strings. So if I put my name in here, and we'll just make a note, this is system.out.printf. And we run this, then you'll see it says hello world, then hello, my name is Andrew. So it's substituted in Andrew for percent s. We'll talk about printf more in the future. And then here we've got a backslash in which says that we want to print a new line. So put s provides a new line for us a lot like sysout.println, and again, just like system.out.println, printf does not. So a lot of the things you already know from Java port really well over to C so far. So yeah, there is our first C program. Now let's go ahead and move on to something that is really important to get under our belts right when we start writing C. It's probably one of the most important differences between C and Java. And this has to do with the sizes of our data types in C. So you'll note here that I wrote int. Right, I wrote int. Int is one of our integer types in C. And now, if you're a Java programmer, especially if you are in my class, then I know that this is probably the only integer type you ever used in Java. You might have used char occasionally, but if you were working with integer values, you were probably using int. Um, which makes sense. I mean, it's, it's kind of just the default integer size in Java. But you may know that in Java, we also had other integer sizes. Like, we might not have used them very frequently, but... We actually have, in Java, some other integer sizes. And they're kind of on this gradient from smallest to largest. We've got char as being one byte, short being two bytes, int being four bytes, and long being eight bytes. And I've written these in terms of bytes. If you're familiar with the definition in terms of bits, as an int is 32 bits, just multiply these values by eight. Eight bits to a byte, so char is eight bits long, short 16 bits, etc, etc. And in the Java abstract machine, we were provided with a guarantee, a, an absolute guarantee, that these types had these sizes. The JVM said, if you write int, it is always going to be four bytes long. It's always going to be 32 bits. Always. No matter what. And so, yeah, so this was very useful in Java. We knew what sizes things were. And it, C inherits all of these same types. In C, we still have char, short, int, long. Java was inspired very heavily by C syntax, shall we say. And so a lot of the concepts that we recognize a lot of the syntax is going to port over directly. One of those things is the integer types. And so I've written a very simple C program here that is going to allow us to see what sizes all of the integer types are on our machine. So here's the program. 
it's pretty short. Up here, we have some pound define nonsense or hash define stuff. This is the C preprocessor, which we're not going to get into. All you really need to know is that it does text substitution. So when I write describe basic type, it's going to take these arguments and substitute them into this expression, which might look something like this. Oh, and you can't see that on screen. Uh, but yeah, just know that it's going to, every time I write type, it's going to substitute whatever I passed in for type. So yeah, so here's a small program to print out all of the integer sizes. Oh, that's the wrong program. Sorry about that. To print out all of the integer sizes on our system. And no, actually, I don't want to do that in C Lion first. I actually want to start off by doing that on Linux so that we get a little bit more practice with compiling C programs. So again, we're going to compile this in just the same way. My file is called intsizes.c. I'm going to output it to a program called int sizes. It compiles. We've got a binary. Let's go ahead and run it. And here's a very pretty table of all of our integer sizes that you cannot see. There is a very pretty table of all of our integer sizes. So again, there's our compile command, right? We're compiling a file called int sizes.c, outputting it to a binary called int sizes. And then we ran our binary, and here's our output. So you see that char here is one byte long, short is two, int is four, long is eight, and then C actually has this additional type called long long. Yeah, so uh, the designers of the C language are not the most creative human beings in the world, and so essentially we've got this type long like we do in Java, and then they said, well, wait a second, we want a future proof. We want there to be the ability to find something that is longer than a long. And so they called it long, long. And here you can see that on my uh, uh, Linux system here, this is running under Ubuntu. There's my, oh, no, you name dash A. There we go. Yep, we're running on Ubuntu under WSL. Our types match what they did in Java. And so... Great, so this is presumably another one of these things that can port directly from Java to C. We've got this introduction of long, long, and so that's a little bit different, but hey, other than that, it looks like everything is fairly straightforward. And now let me go back to C Lion for a second, because I just want to demo compiling our program under Windows, just again to show you maybe how you might compile this in an IDE. I mean, it's really simple, you hit the run button. All right, let's just, you know, make sure that our program is still working. Okay, let's see here. Char, one byte long, short, two bytes, int, four bytes, long. Ha, huh, four bytes. Well, that's not good. We've got the same program running on two machines with two different outputs. So what this means is that apparently on Windows, a long is four bytes long instead of eight. And long, long is still eight bytes, but yeah, long is four bytes. Okay. I mean, that, that, that's fine. You know, Windows is weird. Just overall, as a rule, Windows is pretty bizarre. So you know what? I'm willing to just make an exception and say, okay, fine. In C on Unix, we get these normal sizes. And on Windows, we've got this weird stuff going on where int and long are the same size. But hey, yeah, that's not too bad. That's, that's workable. Now, before we move on, I want to show you one other thing that's kind of interesting. So... Now what we're going to do is I'm going to run kind of an equivalent of this program in MS-DOS. So MS-DOS is the operating system that ran on IBC compatibles, you know, a pretty long time ago, uh, back in the 80s and 90s. And it was just kind of the standard OS that everyone was using. And so I'm going to go ahead and mount my program here. And yeah, Allo, uh, Allo, Allo Gina, Allo Gina, however you pronounce that yeah we are we are gonna get to that we're gonna we're gonna talk about why exactly the windows one might have been different but first i just want to give you this brief kind of interesting tidbit so i have got to do some things really fast i've got to mount a folder and switch to it uh let's see i'm gonna switch to my c drive run my auto exec start windows 3.1 nice there we go we've got our ding ding sound and now I'm going to be using a compiler for Windows 3.1 called... Oh, if I can capture my mouse, please. It's supposed to be Control F10. There we go. Uh, called Borland C++. Borland C++ was one of the biggest, kind of most notable 
uh, C and C++ compilers of the time. And so here we've got something that looks very like our int sizes program that we were running on in C Lion on a modern system, compiling on modern Linux. And you know, this program is basically unchanged for a compiler from 1991 with updates through 1995, but hey. Now let's go ahead and run this program. And you know, this is Windows, right? So I'm expecting to see the same thing as the Windows output. I mean, it's old Windows, but hey. It's Windows nonetheless. So let's run this and we see, okay, char one byte, good, short, two bytes, good, int, why? And long is for, well, hmm. Well, that ain't good. Okay. So, all right, fine. You know what? Let's add one more exception. I am willing to add one more exception to this table and say, you know what? Okay, fine. DOS is weird. DOS is old. Old systems use this convention. Why not? And what you've seen now is something that is somewhat important to note about C. And that is that in C, the integer types, the sizes of the integer types, the widths and bits of the integer types are defined in terms of minima, minimum sizes. So in the C standard, a char is defined as at minimum a single byte. A short is defined at minimum two bytes. Uh, an int is minimum two bytes, and also a long is minimum four bytes. So in other words, this DOS compiler we've got actually adheres to the C standard in terms of keeping the integer sizes at an absolute minimum. But our modern systems use some different conventions. And the thing to note is that our modern systems use different standards to assign actual sizes to these types. Unix, so, you know, Mac OS, Linux, blah, 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 uses a standard called LP64, which means that the long type and pointers are 64 bits long. Uh, int is 32 bytes versus Windows uses this standard called LLP64, which defines long as being four bytes long instead of eight. And so yeah, so these different standards, LP64, LLP64, there are others, exist to assign these actual values, these actual widths to these types. And so if you write code in C that relies on the sizes of these integer types, that code might not be portable between different machines. And that can cause you a lot of headaches when you're trying to port C programs between different machines. It's, it's really quite the inconvenience. It's something that we've got to think about as we're writing our C. And so you may prefer in modern programs to use the fixed width integer types in this header called stdint.h. And now if we switch back to the output of our other program here, then we can see that down below these types that we're familiar with, char, short, int, long, 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 we've got these other types, int 8 sub t, int 16 t, int 32 t, int 64 t. Now, these types are included from the header, stdint.h. They were included in the C11 standard, or sorry, the C99 standard? C11, one, one of the recent C standards. And they allow us to define integers that are an exact width. And so int 8 sub t is always on all systems going to be one byte. Int 16, two bytes. 32, 4, 64, eight bytes right, to get from bits to bytes, we divide by eight. If we go ahead and just look at our uh, our output on Windows now, or sorry, on, uh, on Linux now, you'll see that, well, it's the same, right, for these types, in 8 sub t, 16, 32, and 64. So yeah, great. We now have a way to define these exact width integers kind of the same way we did in Java. And so it's my personal recommendation that for all of the C code you write going forward, you use these types. You use these fixed width types. They will save you an incredible amount of time going forward. <laughs> Expo seed, moral of the story, if it's not Unix, it's weird. Yeah, kinda. Um, <laughs> for, for a lot of modern programmers, myself included, pretty much. And for my students who are going into computer architecture, who are gonna be running your programs on Linux machines, you will also probably need to know these widths, but you'll only need to be familiar with these ones. And so if you remember the integer type sizes from Java, you'll be good to go for your comp architecture class 
uh, writing C. You don't need to know about these weird other standards and whatnot. And if you're writing any code, please go ahead and just use these fixed width types. Uh, is there any reason not to use the fixed width types? Yes, some systems are super duper weird and, well, either don't have them because the compilers are old. Like, our good friend over here, our DOS compiler, if I try and include stdint.h after capturing my cursor and doing 8 bajillion other things. So if I try and include stdint.h, I save this. Oh, no, it's control ks to save. And then I run this. Uh, it's going to give me an error status. There are errors. Okay. Uh, a frequent dialogue I have with myself while programming. It says unable to open include file. So yeah, old compiler straight up doesn't have it. This does not implement the C99 standard because this compiler was released. This may be a surprise before 1999. Uh, so yeah, so that, that's one reason. Another reason might be that sometimes you might actually want this variability. It can be useful importing some types of programs. Operating systems find this extremely useful. Um, and so yeah, if you're writing an OS, you're trying to port an OS, this might actually be a useful property for you. And a third one is that some machines, again, do not actually have 8-bit bytes. There are some machines that have 9-bit bytes. There are some that have 36-bit indivisible words. So there are reasons why you might use these generic types, but, you know, on a modern system with a modern C compiler, I just go ahead and use these guys. Oh, yeah, and uh, Exoseed and Embedded, you don't have the type defs to work with. Yep, exactly. Yeah, you might be running on some weird architecture that only supports some of these or that defines all of them to be the same type, like old Cray supercomputers defined all of these to be 64 uh, bits. There's all kinds of reasons why you might not, but for us on Linux, let's just go ahead and, you know, say we've got the fixed width types. Let's go ahead and use them. And if you ever need the others, then you'll probably be made aware of that. So I introduced in C99, there we go, I had it in the slides, I just didn't want to advance. Um, and it tells us, yeah, so it, u int blah 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 sub t denotes an unsigned integer type that's however many bits wide. And just like in Java, we had the ability to say integer dot min value integer dot max value, this header stdint dot h provides the same functionality, saying u int whatever sub min or u int whatever max gives us the minimum and maximum values of n bit wide integers. And you know, that is pretty cool. Now, the next thing we want to talk about here is something else that's new to see from Java. So this is a completely new concept we haven't talked about yet. And that is this notion of signedness. So in C, an integer can be either signed or unsigned. And it, this is kind of a whole mess of stuff. But what this really means is... Well, well, we'll show you. We'll work through some interactive examples. But in, in Java, we knew that every integer we had could be either positive or negative. Right? It was interpreted as either positive or negative. In C, we can tell the compiler, we can tell the machine whether we want our numbers to be interpreted as being potentially either positive or negative, or whether we should consider them to be just positive. So yeah, so a signed integer in C is those types we just looked at. Char, short, int, long. Long, long. Um, you don't have to put any special prefix in front of them. It is the default, just like it was in Java. But if you want some extra range in the positive uh, side of your integer space, then you can prefix that type with this word unsigned. And so, for example, if you want to go from a signed long to an unsigned long, you just write unsigned long just pretty useful. And I say here signed integers have no prefix. That's not true. You can actually write signed, but I've never seen anyone do it. Uh, so yeah, it's usually signed by default. There may be some strange embedded systems that use unsigned by default, but I've never personally had to work with one, thankfully. And now we've got some things about the ranges of these integers, which is something that is very, very useful to know because it determines which types we use. But I actually want to show you this interactively, so allow me one brief second um, while I connect an iPad to the stream because it looks like mine has disconnected. Awesome. Give me one second, we'll take a break.
Okay, we are back. We're back. You can hopefully see uh, an iPad screen that I can draw on. So hopefully you can see this. Um, so yeah, so uh, we did have a quick note from Expo Seed. Uh, char can be signed or unsigned. It's not specified in the standard. That is true. Yeah, that is true. Um, typically, char is unsigned by default on the types of systems that we are going to be working with. And so if you want a signed char a signed 8-bit value, you may actually have to write signed char, or you can just write int 8 sub t to denote a, a signed 8-bit quantity. Again, our, our std int types, super duper helpful. But anyway, we need to now talk about something that is pretty interesting, but pretty low level from what we've done before, and that is we need to talk about a concept called two's complement. So two's Complement. And now to start talking about two's complement, let's go ahead and um, first review a little bit. Let's go ahead and review the binary representation of integer values. And now, yes, this is something that uh, if you're not new to this, you are probably rolling your eyes going, oh no, we're going to go over this. this is like the 90 billionth time I've had this explained, but we're going to do it anyway because my students might not have seen some of this before or might have just forgotten it from their assignment, which they have to work with binary. So let's go ahead and start off by just doing something very, very simple, which is I am going to write out a signed integer. This is a signed integer. Which we're just going to write... Oh, sorry, I meant an unsigned integer, right? Not a signed integer. We, we want to start off with unsigned. That's the easy one. Sorry. So an unsigned integer. And for this, we're just going to do the direct conversion that we're used to before, using powers of two. Uh... Oh, we had a very brief question from NoosHBH. How did you hook up your iPad's display to OBS? I'm using an application called Reflector. Uh, it's like 20 bucks, but it uses AirPlay to allow me to project my iPad to a window, which I'm screen capturing with OBS. It's uh, it's a kind of roundabout setup, but it seems to work at least. Um, so yeah, so let's go ahead and convert an unsigned int. The value that we're going to be converting just to start is 47. So here is value 47. And now I am going to convert this to an 8-bit uh, binary integer. So, yeah, so we're going to be working with 8 bits here just because it's simple and straightforward to write and doesn't require me to write too many bits. So let's go ahead and make some space for kind of demarcating our bits here. Uh, and bear with me, three, four. I am not the best of artists. Uh, I have a bit of a tremor and so my hands shaky shake. But the good news is this application that I'm using will correct my shapes for me. Anyway, let's go ahead and write the value 47 as an 8-bit binary integer. And now in binary, you may remember that every bit, right? So every 0 or 1 in our binary number corresponds to a single power of 2, which we'll denote here as 2 to the n. And let me zoom in just a little bit here so it's easier for you to see. Now we're going to start on the left with the place value 2 to the 0. So this is going to be 2 to the 0th. And then we work up from there. So this bit is 2 to the 0th, 2 to the 1st, 2nd, 3rd, etc., 4th, 5th, 6th, 7th. And for those of us who haven't memorized your powers of 2, which I encourage you to do at least up until maybe 1024, we'll go ahead and write what this converts to. So 2 to the 0 is 1, 2, 4, 8, 16, 32, 64, and 128. And so now, to convert an integer from decimal to binary, we're going to go from our highest place value, so our highest place value here is going to be our 128, to our lowest, our 1. And every time the value of our integer, or the amount that we have remaining in our integer, is greater than our place value, we're going to write a 1. 
and every time it is less, we are going to write a zero. So let's go ahead and get started here. So 128 is greater than 47. So if we add 128 to our binary integer, our number is going to be, unsurprisingly, greater than 47. And so here we're going to write a zero to say we have no 128s. Same thing applies to 64. 64 is greater than 47, zero 64s in 47. Now 32 is our first one that is less than 47. So I'm going to say, well, in that case, I need a 32 in my binary integer. So I'm going to write a one here and subtract 32 from 47, which is going to give me a value of 15. I'm just going to be keeping track of our kind of temporary values over here to the left under 47, just so, you know, I don't get uh, all twisted. Now, 16 is greater than 15 by just a little bit, so we can add a 16 to our number. We can add an 8. 8 is less than 15. We've got 7 remaining. 4 is uh, less than 7, so we're going to add our 1. We've got 3 remaining. Same thing for 2. And same thing for 1. And so this is 47 represented as an unsigned 8-bit integer. It's 0, 0, 1, 0, 1, 1, 1, 1. In other words, it's 32 plus 8 plus 4 plus 2 plus 1. This is just a base 2 factorization of our number. And so finally, if after we do all these subtractions, we get 0 as our output, then that means that we successfully completed our conversion. So yeah, so that's how this works for uh, an unsigned integer. It's very simple. Our place values just go up from the lowest to greatest. Nothing really complicated here at all. But when we start dealing with signed integers, we have to take into consideration the system of two's complement. And so here, if we start working with a signed integer, then we have to convert our integer to two's complement. All right, so let's see how we are going to do that. Now, a really, really nice thing about converting between, well, about the two's complement notation is that positive numbers are exactly the same as they are in our just kind of unsigned uh, system. And so here, if we try and just convert positive 47 to assigned two's complement integer, we don't have to do anything. It's the same. And that is, well, pretty nice. The problem starts to come in once we start dealing with negative numbers. So let's say that now instead of doing positive 47, I want to convert negative 47. So we're now going to be working with negative 47. Now, the, the way that... Let me write that negative sign a little better. Now, the way that two's complement works is very, very simple. It's pretty easy to get our head wrapped around, and it's actually pretty easy to work with. The difference between our unsigned notation and two's complement is that our most significant bit is now, instead of being a positive value going to be that same power of 2, so it's going to be 2 to the 7th, but we're going to negate it. And so this position now has a value of negative 128. And the same thing applies down here. So this one is also negative 128. And what this lets us do is it allows us to express negative values all the way from, in this case, negative 128 up to negative 1. And we'll see how we derive kind of that minimum value. But you'll notice here that our first place value, our first bit, is negative and all of the others are interpreted as positive. So the way that we are going to do our conversion to a two's complement signed integer for a negative number is we're always, always, always going to have to start off by setting the first bit 
which some people refer to as the sine bit because it reflects whether our integer is positive or negative to 1. And so now we've got a value of 1 for our first bit, which means we have a negative number. And we're going to start off with a factor here of negative 128. And now we need to add subsequent bit values in order to get back up to negative 47. So, let's go ahead and do that. So, remember that we always want to keep our value here less than our target, exactly the same as we did when we were converting our unsigned integer. So, if we add 64 to negative 128, we will get negative 64, which is less than negative 47. And so we want to add a 1, we now have negative 64. If we add negative 32, well, that's going to get us to negative 32, which is greater than negative 47, so we need a 0 here. If we add 16, we get to negative 48. Yes, negative 48, uh, which is what we want to do here. And so we're going to now add a 16, negative 48. And now in order to get up to 47, we know that we only need a 1. We need one more added to negative 48 to get negative 47. So we're going to fill in zeros for these bits, 0, 0, 0, and then put a 1 here. And that's it pretty straightforward, right? All we've done is we've set our first bit to a negative place value, negative 128, and then our subsequent bits are still additive, and we convert them in exactly the same way as we did previously. And so when you have a an unsigned integer in C, we're going to be using this system in which the first place value is positive, and when we have a signed integer, we're using 2's complement, where it is negative. <laughs> Expo seat is more elegant than the way you were taught. Yeah, I've seen really bad explanations of this. Um, I've seen textbooks that go into, like, kind of the theory behind all of this. And honestly, for new programmers, or new C programmers, that's just too confusing. So yeah, this system is really all you need to know to work with 2's complement here. Uh, and Prince Logic, you just make the leftmost power of 2 negative. Yeah, that's exactly what you do. All you do is you flip it from a positive 128 to a negative 128. And then you convert just as you normally would. It's a very elegant, very simple system. And now you might need some practice to get the hang of this. I certainly did. It's a little bit tricky to work with. But I'm sure that you can get the hang of it in no time and... Uh, you know, it's it's just very simple to practice this. All you've got to do is essentially just pick any number and convert it. So yeah, there you go. So that is two's complement. And now this conversion method works. I mean, we just showed that it works. It's the exact same one we used earlier. But in just a little bit, we are going to talk about a faster way to do this. But we'll, we'll, we'll get there. For now, I want to talk about the ranges of the integer values in C. And this is kind of pretty much the big last major concept we're going to talk about today. And so here we're going to talk about the ranges of the integer types. So ranges of the integer types. So let's again start with unsigned integers. Oh, and Noosh has a question. If it were negative three, it would be 1, 0, 1. Well, we can go ahead and just do another example. So let's do fine. Negative 3. Sure. Why not? So negative 3. We're going to have a negative 128 because it's a negative value. So we're going to add 1 to this. We get negative 128. We're going to add 64. Negative 64. 32. Negative 32. 16 negative 16. We still need to add 8 even, negative 8. We still even need to add our 4. So now we're at negative 4. And then finally a 0. We don't want to add a 2. And we want to add a 1 to get us to negative 3. 
So yeah, Noosh, yeah, we've got to start with negative 128 if we're doing a, yeah, if we're doing a signed value, so a negative number, we've got to start with the first place value having a negative value assigned to it. Yeah, exactly. I mean, the, we're working with 8-bit integers here. 2's complement really only makes sense in terms of fixed-width integer types. Um, so, you know, if we just say we have an infinitely large integer, 2's complement doesn't make too much sense. Uh, but here, yeah, we've said it's 8 bits, so our first bit is going to be negative 2 to the 7th. You'd have a 28, as we've got there. But yeah, good question. Glad we could clarify that. Now, let's talk about the ranges of integer types. So, our unsigned types, right? So, unsigned. These unsigned types have a range that extends from 0 up to all of our bits being set, right? Since every single one of these bits had an additive factor, the way we get the biggest value is if we set them all to 1. We say, I'm going to include all of these bits in my number. And so in this case, if we are doing an 8-bit integer, then what's going to happen is we're going to say, okay, so my value is going to be 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, which is 128 plus 64 plus 32 plus 16 plus 8 plus 4 plus 2 plus 1, which equals 255. And now if we look at the fact that this is an 8-bit integer, there's this is an 8-bit integer, which I'll just denote as, I don't know, uh, this is unsigned, so we'll say u8. And then we think about our powers of 2. Well, the power of 2 that comes after 128 which is 2 to the 7th, is 256. Or 2 to the 8th. And so our maximum value here is 2 to the 8th, so 2 to the size of our type, minus 1. And so the range of an unsigned integer in C with n bits is 0 up to and including 2 to the n, minus 1. Right, and we could go through and prove this, right? We could say, so we can never get to the next power of 2 by adding values less than that power. There, there is some theorem that describes that. I'm not too much of a theorist, so if, if anyone knows, you can type in the chat. Um, but yeah, we can very intuitively derive this by just saying if we have an 8-bit int, maximum value is 255, 2 to the 8th, minus 1. And so this applies for all of our unsigned types. And, you know, this makes sense, right? And so we can just say that this is really just all ones. All bits are set to one. Now let's talk about sign types. They're a little trickier because we now have to consider two's complement. So in C, if we are working with signed integer types... our range computation gets harder, but we can derive it very intuitively just like we did our other types. Or just like we did for our unsigned, sorry. And so if we look at this, we see, okay, how can we get the smallest possible value out of this 8-bit unsigned, or this 8-bit signed integer? How can we get the smallest value? Well, that means, you know, smallest for a signed value means most negative, and the way that I see to get the most negative value is if we set this bit to 1 and all of these bits to 0, meaning we have a subtractive factor and no additive factors. And so for this example of our 8-bit um, our 8-bit signed integer, the minimum value would be negative 128, which turns out to be 2 to the 7th, and since our type is n bits, 8 bits wide, our minimum signed integer value is 2 to the n minus 1. 
and we can attain that by setting the first bit to zero, or the most significant bit, meaning just the bit with the largest place value, which will abbreviate here as ms lowercase b, lowercase b for bit, uppercase b for byte. So ms, ms little b set to one, all others are set to zero. Oops. Okay, great. And now let's think about how we can get the largest possible value. Well, the way we get the largest possible value is if we have only additive factors with no subtractive factors. So what this means in this case is that we would not set our negative 128. We don't want to subtract any values to get a big number. And we do want to set all of these other bits here. And so the way we get our maximum value, which for our 8-bit signed integer would be 64 plus 32 plus 16, 8, 4, 2, 1, which turns out to be 127, which turns out to be this expression 2 to the, oh, sorry, this is negative 2 to the n minus 1, right, 2 to the n minus 1 minus 1. And the way that we're going to get that is set the most significant bit to zero and all others to one. Yeah, and that's how we're going to derive our minimum and maximum values for our unsigned and signed integers. And if we pull up our C line window that we were looking at before with our program output, you'll see that, well, that's exactly what we see, right? Let's think about our, uh, our sign or our unsigned integers. Well, well, actually, we'll do the signed first. Our signed integers show this exact relation. Negative 128, 2 to the 7th, to 127, 2 to the 7th minus 1. Our minimum is 0, and our maximum, 2 to the 8 minus 1, 256 minus 1, 255. Same applies for our 16-bit ints, and so on and so forth, all the way down. And so yeah, so that is how we are going to be working with kind of the minimum and maxima of these types. It's something that's important to know because it can dictate what type you choose to represent a value. So let's say that, you know, you're writing a program and you know that you uh, might have a number that can be in the range zero to a million, something like that. Well, since this number is never going to be negative, we know that an unsigned type would probably be very helpful. And in order to figure out which unsigned type we want to use, we pick the unsigned type that can fit our maximum value. So in this case, a byte can't fit a million, that's too small, nor can a short, that's also too small. But a u at 32 sub t, or on Linux, an int, can fit our value. And so in this case, we might choose an unsigned int to represent our value. So yeah, we want to consider our integer ranges along with the range of the values we're going to be working with when we try and discern what types we want to use. And so, yeah, and so here's all this stuff that we just went over. And I will note, there are non-twos complement computers. There are systems that don't use twos complement at all. They use all kinds of crazy stuff. Um, there are systems that use something called ones complement, which is basically the exact inverse of what we just talked about. Um, which, sure, I guess, where in order to have a negative number, the most significant bit is additive and all of the others are subtractive. You can do that. There are systems that use what's called tagged words, which means that you might just have a bit that you set to say this is positive or this is negative, and that bit might live outside the normal integer range. You might have to do special stuff to access it, all kinds of stuff. But for every architecture that we are really going to be working with pretty much ever in a modern computing environment, we have two's complement. And the upcoming version of the C language standard, which we call C2X, which is probably coming out next year, assuming that COVID didn't uh, hamper the committee's ability to be productive, choose complement will be standard for C integers. 
And now we do have one brief thing to talk about, and that is implicit casting. So in Java, you probably saw this when we were working with uh, ints and floats, where if you added an int to a float, the result would be a float automatically. You didn't have to cast it anywhere. C does roughly the same thing, and that if we add a smaller value to a bigger value, the smaller value will be promoted to the larger one. And so, well, sorry, smaller and bigger in this sense, meaning in terms of their uh, the widths of their types. So if we add a char to an int, the char will be promoted to an int, and the result will also be an int that we return out. But if we give an operator, so if we give like addition, a signed and an unsigned operand, both of them are going to be promoted to unsigned. And you might kind of say, uh, okay, sure, I mean, I, I guess we can do that. Uh, th that seems to not really cause any real problems, but hey, why don't we go ahead and test it really fast? We can write a very quick C program to actually test this. So let's see here. So I'm going to write a program. I'm going to call it implicit signed. I'm going to go ahead and make it a C file, get rid of the default header, add it as an executable. I need to be able to actually run it. This is just so I can run my project. You don't need to know what's happening here. This is just a build system called CMake. All right, now let's go ahead and write a very simple program. I'm going to include stdio.h. I want to output some text. And now I'm going to define some integers. I'm going to find an integer called x with a value of 0 and an integer called y with the value of negative one. And now all I want to do is I want to do a sanity check on my system's ability to do math. So I'm going to say if x is greater than y, which it should be assuming everything is working, I'm going to say math is working. Yay. And we're going to return a success exit code after we include std.win. And I'm going to say otherwise. You say what's happening. I want a refund on my CPU because obviously things aren't working. And I'm going to return exit failure, which just indicates that something went wrong in our program. So let's go ahead and run this program and we'll see that, hey, good news. Math is working. Yay! Great! Okay, cool. So we've got functional mathematics. Now I'm going to change something very quickly. I'm going to say that instead of being ints, these are going to be unsigned ints. Now you might be kind of looking at this saying, whoa, 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 wait, you said unsigned, this is negative one, what happens? Well, this happens. Oh no, something didn't work. Something failed fairly catastrophically here. Uh, what, what, what's happening? My computer is very clearly broken. I, 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 I compared zero to negative one and it said that like, that zero is not greater than negative one. Everything is bad and terrible. Well, not necessarily, not necessarily. So what's happening here is that negative one is actually just equivalent to the two's complement bit string in which we set every single bit to true, right? We set every bit. Every bit is a one. So if this were an unsigned char, right? So if we had an 8-bit value, so this were an unsigned char instead, 8-bit value, then it would look something like this, where we would have one for our negative 128, and then we would need to add 64, 32, 16, etc., cetera, et cetera, in order to get negative one. And obviously here we're working with ints, which means we have four of these. And so let's just go ahead and, oops, didn't mean to do that. Let's go ahead and paste this three more times. There we go. And we'll separate these by uh, bytes. It's a little easier to read. There we go. And so what's happening is when we convert this to an unsigned value, remember that this leading place value goes from negative to positive. 
And so this actually becomes a really, really big number, right? This becomes a giant number. And so our negative one is actually converting to two to the 31st minus one. Right, so this really, uh, oh, sorry, two to the 32nd uh, minus one when it's unsigned, right? So this really, really, really giant value. Like, okay, fine, sure, whatever. I, all right, I don't want that. I would really quite like these to be signed. And so, you know what? I'm just going to say, all right, fine, fine. Why? You're now signed. This will surely fix the problem, right? We've got an unsigned int with zero. Hey, zero's in the unsigned range. We're good. We've got negative one, an int. We're in int range. Yeah, that's good too. All right, we should be good. Let's go ahead and run our program now. And, oh, hmm. Well, that ain't good. So here's where we run into a very peculiar behavior of C, which is again, if we have a binary operator, which means arithmetic or comparison, and we have an unsigned operand and a signed operand, both are coerced to unsigned before evaluation. And so y is actually being coerced to 2 to the 32nd minus 1. The way that we fix this is we can either tell the C compiler, hey, I want y to be signed. Y is a signed value. Interpret it as signed. Oh, and we have to do it to both of these, of course. Or, of course, we can just define x as signed int or just int. That would work too. But yeah, so when we are writing C code, we've just got to be very, very cognizant of this implicit conversion from unsigned to signed by default. Or sorry, from signed to unsigned, rather, by default, if we have a signed and unsigned operand. It's something that, honestly, you're probably not going to run into that frequently, but every time I've run into it, it's frustrated me to no end. So it's a, it's a nice thing to know. It's just something that you might want to kind of keep in your back pocket for future use. All right. And so this is pretty much the end of our discussion of C integers today. Um, and it, yeah, so this means you need to be really, really careful with comparisons. And as I mentioned before, the Java rule applies of if you have operands of different widths, then the smaller one will be promoted to the larger width. So again, a char plus int yields int. Uh, char plus long yields long, int plus long yields long, right? There's this kind of fixed hierarchy. It's the same one that there was in Java that defines how our implicit casting works. All right, lovely. So yeah, so that is the end of our discussion on signedness. Um, and there is one more very, very kind of simple concept that we have to consider when we are talking about signedness. And that is, oh, my uh, iPad is gone. Oh no, let's get that back. And it, what we need to talk about is how this affects C's bitwise operators. So if you're a Java programmer, you've really only worked in Java and other managed languages, very high level languages, then this is probably something that you're aware of. Um, you might be aware of the fact that we have these operators that we call bitwise, and you're probably aware of them um, because they resulted in you, uh, having weird typos before. And so, yeah, we're going to very, very, very briefly talk about our bitwise operators in C. So let's make a new page of our notes. And just by the way, these notes are going to be available. Um, I'll send out an announcement containing the PDF of these notes so you can read them later. And so, yeah, so we need to talk about bitwise operators. And honestly, these are really, really, really simple. So yeah, bitwise operators. So C has some operators that operate on the arithmetic values of our integers, right? So things like addition, subtraction, multiplication, division, modulo, they're exactly the same as they are in Java, they work the same. But we also have these operators, and Java has them too, but you probably just haven't seen them, that operate instead on the bit-level representations of our integers. 
And so we're going to go through and very briefly talk about what happens when we run a bitwise operator on some different values. So let's say that I am going to run our first bitwise operator that we want to talk about today. Let me make this just a little bigger. Is and. So bitwise and. And now I'm going to write a truth table for this in the same way that you may have seen in the discrete math class. My students are now having terrible flashbacks. And in C, the bitwise and operator is written using an ampersand, right? And so this is analogous to, in, uh, in kind of our formal logic notation, a um, this thing, B. All right, so we're going to draw a truth table for this operator for one bit. And so, let's start off values of A and B. 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1. Right? We're used to writing truth tables. We know how this works. And in order to run the AND operator on these bits, we're literally just going to apply conjunction, binary conjunction, from discrete math. It's very simple. So, 0 and 0 is 0. 0 and 1 is 0. 1 and 0 is 0. 1 and 1 is 1. And that's it. That is the whole operator right there. There you go. That's AND. A single ampersand versus the double ampersand, which is our Boolean conjunction. But yeah, so there is our single bitwise AND. We've also got another operator. Again, something that you definitely have seen before. Let me go ahead and copy-paste this table for us. And the next operator we're going to talk about is bitwise disjunction, or, as you may have heard of it called, exclusive or. And so this in C is written using a single pipe character, this guy right here. And this is equivalent to a bitwise disjunction from, uh, from Boolean logic. And this is going to work exactly the same way as that operator in which we've got 0 or 0 is 0 and then 1s for all the rest. Something we're used to. We've got some other ones in C. They're pretty fun. We've got exclusive OR or XOR, which is probably that one that you learned about uh, and then might have forgotten what it is just because we don't see it that frequently. So XOR in C is written using this guy, the caret. If you have a uh, US keyboard like I do, it's uh, above the 6 key. And this corresponds to XOR in discrete math, which most people seem to write like that. And I'm just going to note, yeah, this is XOR. An exclusive OR is going to return true when only one of the values is true and false otherwise. So 0 and 0, false. 0 and 1, true. We have 1, 1. 1 and 0, true. 1, 1, false. And then finally, we get to our very last bitwise operator that we want to talk about, which is the simplest of them. You probably know it well. And for this, we don't even need this giant table. At all, really. Let's just erase most of this. And the one that we are going to talk about now is negation. So, in C, you can very easily negate binary values. Using something very similar to what we did in our discrete math course. Which is where we said not a, which in C is written using the tilde, the thing above the uh, the backtick key. It's, it's the one next to one, in case you're not familiar with it, um, which is equivalent to saying not a. And so this just inverts bits. And now if we apply these operators to integers, then they apply to every bit at a time. And so if I say, for example, let's say, you know, int a equals, 
and we're going to work with some very small values here. So let's say that it's, um, you know, 15. Which in binary, we'll just write off to the side here, is uh, 1, 1, 1, 1. And then here we'll say int b is equal to, what would be a good value? Uh, 10. Which is 1, 0, 1, 0. And if we run all of our bitwise operators on these, we can see the result. So if we do A and B, then we're just going to go through, and for each bit, we're going to see what the corresponding pairs are, and then run them through our truth table for Boolean conjunction. And so in this case, let's see here. So A and B is going to be, let's see, we've got 1 and 1, which is 1. 1 and 0 is 0. 1 and 1 is 1. 1 and 0 is 0, which means that we are going to have a value. And so this is in base 2, which is 10 in base 10. If we do conjunction A or B, we end up with, okay, so, well, one dominates, right? That's the rule of domination, that true or something is always true. And so we get one, 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 one base two, or 15 in base 10. XOR is the tricky one. So remember that XOR is true if only one bit is sent in both numbers. So we've got 1 XOR 1 is 0, 1 XOR 0 is 1, 1 XOR 1 is 0, 1 XOR 0 is 1 in base 2, is 5 in base 10. And then finally, just as a final note, if we negate B... Then we're going to just flip all of the bits. So we get 0, 1, 0, 1 in base 2, which is equal to uh, 5 in base 10. Now, this works out so that XOR and negation are the same purely because I defined A as being all ones. This does not work in the general case, so you cannot rely on XOR and negation always returning the same value. This is something that people sometimes kind of stumble into and think is generalizable. It's not really. It only works when one of the operands is all ones. And so now, okay, great. So these are our bitwise operators. They operate on the underlying bit representation of a number. And so it doesn't care if it's signed or unsigned, you are going to get the exact same result because it's operating on the bit stream that underlies that value, not the arithmetic value itself. So here, these operators are only concerned with these binary values over here. They don't care whether it's positive or negative or any of that. Now we've got two more operators to talk about, and these are ones that you probably have not seen before. We haven't really worked with them, and they are our shifts. So let's say that we want to shift a value uh, to the left, and we'll talk about what that means. So let's say we do a left shift, which is written in C using two less than signs, B. And what this means is that we want to shift A by B bits to the left. And so let's say that we wrote in binary we wrote, uh, let's say we did 0, 1, 
0, 1, 1, 0. And this is base 2. Uh, left shift 3. Base 10. So what we're going to do here is we are going to take each bit from this value, or from this value, you can't see me gesturing, sorry, from this value, and we're going to shift it three place values to the left. And I will note here that because our integer types in C are a fixed width, we're going to have truncation that might occur if we try and shift something off the end. So if we had a six bit type, let's say that we do just for the sake of argument, and we tried to shift this and we try to shift this bit three to the left. Well, this is the limit of our type. So we would be shifting one, two, three out of bounds and that value would completely go away. And so what's going to end up happening is we shift these values, one, one, zero, three positions to the left. Those are one, one, zero. Those are one, one, zero. And then for all of the values that hang off the end, right? Because our value is still six bits long, we provide zeros. So we shift in zeros in this case. This is what's what we call shifting in, where we're essentially creating new values. And in this case, if we interpret this as um, as decimal, this would be uh, 1, 2, 4, 8, 16 plus 32, or 48 base 10. And Noosh asks a question, why do we have these things? Why would we use these operators? And that's a great question. Oftentimes they are used when we need to do direct bit manipulation, which is a pattern that emerges for actually a lot of things in C. Um, and we can talk about how some of those work in a future, uh, in a future stream on a future day. I'm definitely going to get to that. But in short, uh, we use these when we want to do direct bit manipulation, which for embedded systems turns out to be super duper handy for really all kinds of stuff. If we're trying to pack values into the smallest uh, size possible, it's very useful for that. There are all kinds of reasons why we would use these. Um, but for now, yeah, they kind of exist just in abstraction, but we'll, we'll, we'll get to the application of these. And now we've got one more operator, which is the right shift. Now, A right shift B says shift A by B. Or sorry, shift A by B bits to the right. And now this is going to follow the same principles as the left shift. In terms of that, we're going to take a bit and shift it down however many positions. Right? So same general concept. But... These have, this operator has a kind of weird caveat that we've got to talk about. So, if we have an unsigned integer value, oh, if we have an unsigned integer value, that's probably a little bit too zoomed in, sorry about that. The values that we supply to the left, right? So the values that we supply after we've shifted our values down to the right is always going to be zero. And so we're going to shift in zero. However, for a signed value, we have to do something that's a little bit different, which is we're going to shift in the most significant bit. This is a concept that we call sign extension in C. Well, and just kind of in general, in programming. Which means that the sign bit, right? So the most significant bit, this bit that determines whether our integer is positive or negative, this guy right here, is going to be extended as we shift to the right. And, uh, yeah, ExpoSeed says, yeah, bit shift is faster than multiplying or dividing by two. That is true. Actually, with a lot of modern compilers, I mean, if you try to multiply or divide by two, they may, on higher optimization levels, actually substitute these bitwise operators for you. They may substitute shifts. I know that GCC can do that uh, on 
At least it does it on like O2 and O3. It might do it on lower levels too. Uh, but yeah, they, they can also be faster because instead of running through arithmetic logic, we're running on bitwise logic, which again, doesn't care what the value is. It just cares that you have some bits and you want to do some stuff to them. So let's do a right shift. Let's do an example of a right shift. And so here I'm going to say that I want to right shift the value. Let's do one, zero, zero. 110. And I'm going to note that this is base 2 unsigned. And I'm going to right shift it by 3 again. Oh, I'm going to, sorry, right shift it, if I can write, by 3 bits to the left. Or sorry, 3 bits to the right. All right. Now, how we're going to do this is the exact same way we did before. We're going to shift each bit down three positions. If we shift off the end, then we're just going to discard that bit so that value goes away. We're going to shift each bit down three positions. So we've got one, one, zero, base two. And because this is unsigned, when we shift to fill in those other values, we are going to supply some zeros. Great, that was fairly simple. And it, you'll note here that we've got, okay, so 100110 converts to 110, which has a value in base 10 of 6. So now, for fun, let's do the same thing for a signed value. So now we've got that same integer, uh, 100110. base 2, but this time it's signed. We're going to right shift it by 3 bits. Alright, so what are we going to get here? Well, we're going to do roughly the same operation to actually do the shift. We're still going to have a 1, 1, 0. But in order to determine the value that we shift in, we've got to look at the first bit. So in this instance, the first bit is a 1. The most significant bit is a 1, and so we are going to shift in a 1. And so here we've got 1, 1, 1. Okay, so now why do we do this, right? You're kind of like, oh, okay, I mean, I, I see why, you know, I, I see like this is a thing that we can do, right? And by the way, this is equal to a value of... Um, negative 2 in base 10. But why on earth do we do this? Why do we do this sign extension stuff? Oh, um, Blue Jay, how did I get the 110? Oh, I'm sorry, I should have written 100. That's my bad. That was a, uh, a writing error. There we go. I meant to say 100. Sorry about that. There we go. Good catch, good catch. Did I do that on the other one too? I did. Oops. I must have just gotten my uh, wires crossed with the previous example. It happens. Oh well. But so, y yeah, why would we, why would we do this? And the reason why this is a super duper useful property for us to have, why sign extension is such a cool thing, is Let's say that, you know, we want to work with a value like, hmm, let me think here. Let's say that I want to work with a value negative three. So actually, you know, to make this even simpler, we're going to work with negative four. Okay, so value negative four. Negative four is going to be represented as one, one, zero. So negative four base 10. is equal to 1, 1, 1, 1, 0, 0. Base 2 signed. That's a terrible E. And now I want to right shift it just one bit to the right. So shift 1. 
Now the value that I'm going to get is going to be 11100 from my shift. I'm sorry, 1110 from my shift. 11110. And now we're going to shift in a 1. And if we convert this thing to decimal, then we get negative 2. And this shows us a really fun property of our bitwise operators, which is that a right shift corresponds to division by 2, and a left shift corresponds to multiplication by 2. And so yeah, so an observation. Left shift is analogous to multiplying by 2. And right shift is analogous to division by 2. Obviously, you know, with, with integer truncation, right? We're, we're still working with ints, so we still have truncation. But yeah, so these are kind of some very simple equivalents that we can use to uh, multiplying and dividing values by 2. And so we can use the bitwise operators to do these. And more specifically, if we left shift by a value of n, so if we left shift n bits, then we are multiplying our value by 2 to the n. Right, so we left shifted one bit, we multiplied our value by 2, or 2 to the first. And a right shift by n is division by 2 to the n. And the reason that this whole thing works is because of this two complement, two's complement sign extension. If we didn't have two's complement sign extension, then this entire thing would break down. And so we actually have different terms to refer to these different types of shifts. The unsigned shift does not care about preserving the integer value of the value that we're shifting. And so we call this type of shift a logical shift. Because all it cares about is the logical values, the zeros and ones, that make up the number. Versus our sign, signed shift does care about preserving that arithmetic property of multiplying and dividing by 2, or by powers of 2, and so we call this an arithmetic shift. And so yeah, so it actually matters whether or not our operands are signed or unsigned when we're using these two operators. And now I will note one more very quick thing before we go. And the thing that I want to note just very briefly before we leave today is a bitwise way of doing fast, um, of doing fast negation of two's complement numbers. And so we're going to talk about two's complement negation. Let's see here. Yeah, we'll go ahead and give that a section header. Two's complement negation. So in order to negate a number in two's complement, so let's say that I have an integer called a. And A has a value of 47. All right, so A's got a value of 47. Let's go ahead and write that out in binary, just while we're here. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. And actually, you know what? This is, I'm just going to treat this as a signed 8-bit value, which means, of course, that, you know what? Instead of using int, Let's go ahead and use our nice standard int type, int 8 sub t. All 
and we're going to write this out the same way we did before. So, a, a 47 in 2's complement is no 128s, no 64s, 132, no 30 seconds. No, I'm sorry. Um, yeah, no 16ths, sorry. So, 132, no 16ths, and then all 1s and the rest. Now, let's say that I now want to write the value negative 47. So we're going to say negative 47. So our result, let's see here, let's go ahead and put it down here. If we're trying to write a negative 47 in 2's complement, then that's going to be... As we said earlier, 1, 1, 0, 1, 0, 0, 0, 1. Now, in order to get from our positive value to our negative value, we can actually do this through a series of very, very simple um, bitwise manipulations. So the first thing I want us to observe is that every bit, except for this last one, so all of these bits, when we go from the positive to negative, they're just flipped, right? Every time we've got a zero, we get a one. Every time we get a one, we get a zero. And so I'm going to start off by doing a bitwise inversion of A. And so let's actually do that in a different color so we can see it. So this is a bitwise inversion of A. We get 1, 1, 0, 1, 0, 0, 0, 0, which is equivalent to negative 48. All right, and so this actually gives us a value of negative 48, which isn't quite what we were looking for. We wanted negative 47. But, well, you know what? To get to negative 47 from negative 48, all I've got to do is add 1. So what if I just say invert A plus 1 was negative 47, and the bit stream that we get is 1, 1, 0, 1, 0, 0, 0, 1, which matches. And so, okay, cool, 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 cool. Now we've got this kind of, it seems like we've got an expression to go from positive to negative. We say, we invert all of the bits and we add one and that gets us the value we were looking for. Can we go the other way? Yeah, now I'm wondering, can, can we go the other way? So can I then say, okay, let's say that I want to get from negative 47 back to positive 47. So, you know what? Let's do the same thing. All right, so let's do bitwise inverse of negative A and figure out what that would be. All right, well, we've got 0, 0, 1, 0, 1, 1. If I can write, which I can't, 0, I'm sorry, 1, 1, 1, 0. Okay, and that's equal to 46. Oh my, is this actually going to work going the other way too? So let's say we do complement negative A plus 1 yields a value of, well, 0, 0, 1, 0, 1, 1, 1, 1, which sure enough matches our initial bit stream is 47 and we get back to the value that we were expecting. So the thing that we learn from this is to negate a, t a signed two's complement number. So if we have a number n, negative n is equal to the complement of n plus one. And that's a general rule that applies in nearly all cases. The only thing we have to watch out for 
is if we have a value that we cannot negate. All right, so if we go back to our integer limits, you'll see that for signed integers, we actually have one more value on the negative side than we do on the positive side. So what happens if we say negate the limit of a type? What if we had a char and we negate, or a signed char, we negate negative 128? What happens? Well, so, you know, we can't really do that very well because, okay, so we can't represent 128 using a signed int. We can always just promote it, or using a signed char, we can always promote it to the next size, but, you know, that's not the approach that the designers of C really wanted to use. And it turns out that there's no really good answer to this question. There isn't. There are all kinds of different things that we could do. And so the designers of the C language chose to say that if you attempt to negate the maximum value for a type, or I'm sorry, the minimum value for a sign type, the behavior of that operation is not going to be defined by the C standard, which we call this scary term, undefined behavior. And let's see if I can fit the word behavior down here. Behavior, okay, good, I can. Which sometimes we just abbreviate to UB. And so yeah, so if you attempt to negate the minimum value of a signed type, it is undefined behavior. We don't know what happens. It can vary between machines. It can vary even potentially between implementations of C compilers. Seriously, there's all kinds of different things that could happen here. But I'm just going to tell you that on x86, so on the architecture that you probably have in your machine that you're watching this on, unless you're on an iPad or you have an Apple Silicon Mac, on x86, negation is literally, negation of assigned integer value is literally done using this uh, operation uh, complement plus one. And so if we do, let's see, we do, you know, negative 128, or we do negative, negative 128, sorry. So we do negative signed char negative 128 is equal to 128 or is equal to negative 128 and the reason that that happens is it's just doing this exact same process so we are um i actually wait is that wrong uh let me think about it we're going to do a bitwise inversion of all the bits, and then add one, yeah. So it's negative 128. Um, so you can pretty much rely on, on the machine that you're using, this is what's going to happen. But just note that it's not officially defined by the C standard, and if you're working on some weird architecture, you're doing embedded systems programming, or whatever may have you, you may see different results if you try and do that. So just be careful when you negate to note that you might overflow a type on one end of a signed int, but not the other end. All right, and so that is the conclusion of today's lesson. This one went a little bit longer than I was initially planning for it to, and so I, I apologize to keep some of you here a little bit longer than you may have thought. I did initially say that this was going to be only an hour, and ended up being two, but we went over a lot of very important concepts today, and I hope that uh, you were able to learn from these and that everything kind of makes sense. So yeah, I am going to go ahead and end it here. Uh, thank you all for watching. Thank you for everyone who tuned in live. I hope that you uh, enjoyed the stream. It went pretty well overall. The whole iPad thing was new, but that seemed to work okay. Um, and as always, please let me know if you have any questions. You can send me a PM. If you're one of my students, then you can post on our discussion board. And if you're watching this on YouTube, because I'm going to be posting this to YouTube later, feel free to ask questions in the comments. The video will be public. So yeah. In that case, yeah, have a wonderful day, y'all. Um, Prince Logic, I'm glad that you learned a lot. 
I am going to see everyone back here at the same time tomorrow, and every day for pretty much the next two weeks, we're going hard on this, um, when we are going to talk about the other non-integer types in C. And actually, we're going to talk about ints a little bit. We're going to talk about ints a little bit more, too. Um, but we're going to talk about non-integer types. And it, so, yeah, that'll, that'll, be, that'll be fun. Uh, so, yeah, everyone enjoy your day. Take care. And I'm going to sign off here. Bye-bye.